And now finally, but not last, least, Leslie Woodward. And Leslie will be talking to us about the, you know, we've been talking about different strategies. And Dr. Laibuta talked about every child, every right. And I think that is what Leslie is trying to do with her work. Every child, every right from the earliest years. So she will talk to us about how human rights values can be instilled, children can be socialized into human rights values from the earliest years. So let me introduce her. It's not easy introducing Leslie. So, because it's very long. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. So Leslie was voted by the New York Times as the number two most impactful wo woman of 2015, second to Hillary Clinton, and has been awarded the prestigious Swedish Anna Lind Human Rights Prize, previously won by US Ambassador uh, uh, Madeleine Albright. She has also been named, Secretary of State actually, she has also been named SAFE's Global Hero of 2015, Global Thinker by Foreign Policy, and the Global Mind Dead Award for Arts and Education in 2019. In 2019, Leslie was awarded the UN Women for Peace Activist Award at the UN, UN Association, USA's Global Citizen of 2019, and the Gandhi Foundation International Peace Award. A former filmmaker, and now campaigner for a system change on education. Leslie is no stranger to successful campaigning films. Who bombed Birmingham for HBO and Granada TV directly led to the release of the Birmingham Six after 17 years of wrongful imprisonment. Her feature film, East is East, is East won 35 prestigious awards worldwide, including BAFTA for best film. It did, this film did much to promote tolerance and the celebration of diversity as between the Asian and British communities and has become a classic film taught in schools across Europe. Her documentary, India's Daughter, has been critically acclaimed around the globe, won 32 awards including the Peabody Award and the Amnesty International Media Award for Best Documentary of 2016, and sparked a global movement to end violence against women and girls. The searing insights yielded by the two and a half journey making India's daughter led Leslie to found two and a half years journey making India's daughter led Leslie to found UK and US based not for profit global education initiative. Think Equal, of which she is the CEO. This early year's education program, the solution to the problem, the film laid bare, is currently impacting 39,850 young children in 14 countries across five continents. Partners of Think Equal include UNICEF, UNESCO, even Pope Francis, <laughs> Pope Francis's scholars. The AC Milan Foundation, you can see it's very diverse, Montessori, the Institute for Healthy Minds in Wisconsin, Madison University, Charter for Compar Compassion, the Dalai Lama, Emory University's Social and Ed Social Education and Ethics Curriculum, and the Yale University Center for Emotional Intelligence. So Leslie, tell us. Well, that's exhausted me. I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, if, um, if that sounds like um, a, a long and impressive list of awards, let me tell you that I've set my bar even higher uh, for this, this webinar. Uh, and if I cannot persuade you, Dr. Laibuta, to amend that child bill for Kenya and bring in what I consider to be a right, a human right of our children that is not yet enshrined in any framework of law, then I will have failed. So please, 
please be persuaded. Um, look, the first thing I want to say is how thrilled uh, I am to be here and, and honoured um, because Sao, Sao Domini and Veronica, Dr. Laibuta, Declan, Sheila, um, you do extraordinary work and I'm, I'm in awe and, and great admiration and respect of, of all that you do. Um, I, I want to talk um, in my 10 minutes um, about prevention uh, and about our culpability, our responsibility in human rights abuses because I genuinely believe we, every single one of us, are responsible for abuses of human rights. I, I want to just, just mention um, an image that, uh, that haunts me every single night that I cannot get out of my head and uh, that I saw on, on television, I think it was about three weeks ago now, um, do you remember in Afghanistan, uh, very recently, there was um, a, a, an atrocity, a planned um, terrorist attack, and this time the attack was planned and carried out on a maternity hospital. And newborn babies died in large numbers, and mothers who had just given birth, who were about to give birth, and fathers died in large numbers. And there was this image of a soldier, a man with a gun, running out of that maternity hospital, cradling a newborn baby in his arms. And that just epitomizes for me our shame, our shame as human beings. And the reason why we need a new humanism, we need it urgently. And we need each and every one of us to be active participants in crafting that and making damn sure on a very active level, not a theoretical level, not an academic level, and with the greatest respect, not even a legal level. Because the truth of the matter is that culture trumps law. Sorry to use such an unfortunate verb. Um, culture trumps law. So we can have all of the frameworks um, and, and, you know, uh, laws and charters and codes and conventions. Now we have the Human Rights uh, Declaration. We've had it for 72 years. I just want to, because I am uh, focusing on prevention, I want to look and, and actually read out to you, if I may, what Article 26 of that, you know, venerated and respected and fantastic declaration um, of human rights for us all says about education. And why have I chosen education? Because ultimately, if culture trumps law, then it's the discriminations, it's the mindset that lead to the violence that are the real disease. The disease is not the violence, is not the abuse of human rights. It's what leads to those. Those are the symptoms of the disease. And the disease is discriminatory mindset. And in a moment, I'll flesh that out and make it less theoretical and tell you how I discovered that to be the case briefly. But how can we change mindset? How else can we change mindset but through education? The question is, what kind of education? Now, we know what kind of education. We've known it for a very long time. Let's take a look at what um, Article 26 of the Human Rights Declaration says about education as a right of every child, what that mu education must encompass. It says, education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship amongst all nations, races, or religious groups. 
and shall further the activities of the UN for the maintenance of peace. Nowhere there do I see that education shall encompass from a human rights perspective those competencies and skills that we are so obsessed with teaching our children because they lead to what we perceive to be a good place in the labor market, a good job. Numeracy, literacy, testing, that's not education other than for a very limited purpose. The education that we need for our children and that I believe should be encoded in our statutes, in our laws, and should be made compulsory as an expression of our duty of care to our children, which clearly we have. That is why they're defined as children, because they require care and intervention and protection and we are failing our children and have been neglectful of our duty of care for them by allowing there to be a missing core fundamental purpose of education, the missing subject, the missing third dimension, which I call social and emotional learning. Teaching our children how not to grow up and rape, how not to grow up and commit suicide, or suffer from depression, the number two disease we have now in the world. Suicide, the number one killer of young men in the UK where I'm situated now. Rape, one in three uh, women and girls across our planet. I mean, we know all this, we are so aware of it that we're actually becoming inured to it, we've normalized it. And I maintain that until and unless we bring to the core purpose, certainly of early years education, and by early years education, I mean prior to the age of six. The core purpose of early years education, whilst the personality of the child is being developed, must be enabling that child to fulfill his or her potential as a dignified human being, who respects the dignity of all others, who will not grow up to commit human rights violations. Because the way we treat human rights violations, and, and we should hang our heads in shame about this, is we deal primarily, we put our resources, our energies, our concerns into the fallout from human rights violations. What we should be doing is, of course, dealing with that because we have to. <laughs> but what we are not doing and must start doing really seriously is to prevent our children from growing up to become perpetrators of human rights violations. And I'm, I'm just going to end by very briefly telling you, because I don't want you to think, you know, I've, I've come to this from some kind of research or, or theoretical position. I came to this because I sat for several hours uh, in, in jail cells, um, prison cells, with the perpetrators of the most extreme uh, violations of human rights. Um, three gang rapists um, who had gang raped a, a, a young woman on a moving bus in, in, it doesn't matter where, it happens all over the world all the time, every day, um, who, who had gang raped this girl until her intestines were hanging out of her body and they then threw her to die on the side of the road. Um, I interviewed one man who had raped a five-year-old girl and when I asked the rapists of the young woman on the bus why they were expressing no remorse, no regret, they basically explained that they genuinely didn't believe they had done wrong. That girl, they said, had broken all of the dictates of patriarchal society. She was out late at night, that makes her a bad girl. She was with a boy who wasn't her husband or her brother, that makes her a slut. 
And they said not only did she deserve what she got, but they had a duty to teach her a lesson. That is what they told me. And in 31 hours of interviews, they expressed not one second of regret or remorse. And the guy who had raped the five-year-old, who didn't, of course, have the excuse that that five-year-old was out late at night or breaking the regulations that are reserved for girls and women in some jurisdictions or, or cultural, socio-cultural jurisdictions, because this has nothing to do with the law. It has everything to do with culture. He had not that excuse. So what did he tell me was his reason for feeling no remorse or regret? He said, word for word, he said, she was a beggar girl. Her life was of no value, quote, unquote. We in sociocultural programming are teaching our children the kinds of discrimination that are fueling human rights. When I sat for 31 hours with those perpetrators of human rights violations, I was absolutely clear. There was an inevitability about what they grew up to do because we had taught them how to think and in teaching them how to think, actually we're laying the foundation for their later actions. So to sum up, Think Equal is an incredibly practical, concrete, replicable, scalable, and free to the point of direct costs of, of printing and production of materials, etc. So that it'll scale. And it is a program that says without active and universally um, a, a, a achievable, so that there is a, a, an equality of standard of teaching so that we're not relying on, particularly in the early years, by the way, where we've been treating the workforce as babysitters uh, and have not skilled or respected or paid our workforce enough, we can't necessarily expect all of our early years practitioners to be trained, competent, brilliant enough to know how to mediate the competencies and skills which are critically important like empathy, gender equality, emotional literacy, emotional self-regulation, peaceful conflict resolution. I couldn't go on. Um, I'm not going to because I don't have time, but www.thinkequal.org uh, will have you know the, the whole list of the 25 skills and competencies that we directly teach in Think Equal. Um, and, and it is our responsibility to teach these in a concrete way uh, and in an instructional, prescriptive way. And we have to get in there with our children before the age of six. Because if we believe science, as we proclaim to do, we uh, proclaim to, to respect neuroscience, for example, greatly. Well, neuroscience is very clear that to put in the foundation for the rest of one's life in respects of activity in the developing brain and the physical architecture of the brain, the, um, the, the literally the furniture of the neural pathways in the brain, uh, by the age of six, trajectories of habitual ways of responding, of emotional control, empathy, flatline. It's very difficult after that. And why in God's name would we be so irresponsible to build the building from the ground or even first floor up without putting in the foundations? Why would we spend our efforts, our time and our energy in trying to undo the bad wiring that socio-cultural thinking with all of its discriminatory mindsets, attitudes, behaviors that parents are passing down cyclically and generationally to their children because they haven't learned any better? Why would we rely on trying to undo those later in life when we can actually build the child with the foundations of a global citizen who loves, not hates? Mandela said, no child is born hating another human being because of the color of their skin, their religion, gender, or any other background. A child has to be taught to hate. And if he can be taught to hate, then he can be taught to love. The very last thing I want to do is quote Mahatma Gandhi, another great man, um, who, apropos of the last sentence of Article 26 of the Declaration of Human Rights, 
which says that education shall further the activities of the UN for the maintenance of peace. Gandhi said, if we want to achieve real peace in this world, we will have to start with the children. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Leslie. If we want to achieve peace, we must start with our children. And I think that is something all our panelists have been saying in one way or another. We must recognize our children, all children. We must not discriminate. We must make sure they're not victimized. But we may have all the laws in the world, but if we cannot change the mindset, then we cannot achieve peace. We will all remain culpable if we do not take action. So thank you so much, Leslie, and everybody else. Leslie, maybe you could just tell us very briefly in one or two minutes before I hand over to Declan. Uh, at Think Equal, you know, you are instilling uh, human rights values from the early age. Can you give us a small example of maybe the content or how you do it? Very briefly. I'm going to give you my favorite example. Um, and it is to do with um, discrimination. Uh, and it, it actually is, is so important to us. It appears in lesson one, week one, level one. <laughs> level one is for children of three to four years old, level two, four to five, level three, five to six. And then we stop, not because one shouldn't continue, of course, but because we have limited capacity, energy and time. Um, and and uh, so, so in the first week, we have a book and each week we actually have a book which we've created, which is a narrative picture book, which excites empathy and storytelling and character um, to engage the children. And, and each book floats the theme or themes of that week. And then we have three lesson plans, which are absolutely clear and prescriptive and easily implementable um, by practitioners, uh, which work on with art, with music, in various ways, work on those themes. So we have um, one portrait, which goes with the book, Me, Myself and I. The book, Me, Myself and I, shows people, we, we actually re-illustrate it for every country, but we ensure that we show people in all of their multi-colored um, glory. And, um, we we have a beautiful little portrait which was created by an artist called Angelica Das, which has six color tones of skin on them. Um, and at a certain point in the book, the teacher has read out, I love my hair, my eyes, my skin, because this is a book that's celebrating me, but me is the different me's that exist in my world, in my country. Um, and the teacher then uh, is instructed or invited to ask the children to have a discussion about hair. Do we all have the same hair? Now, clearly, looking around, I can only see the panel. We don't have the same hair. And the children come to that conclusion. And they then are asked to discuss the various kinds, lengths, textures, colors of hair we have. We then do the same with eyes. And then... The teacher reads again, you know, I like my hair, my eyes, my skin, and asks the children, do we all have skin? Well, yes, the children come to the conclusion after discussion, we all have skin. Do we all have the same color skin, asks the teacher. And even if it's a homogenous um, classroom where children do have the same or similar colors of skin, the teacher has her... Um, her, her little six portraits of different colors of skin from around the world. And she will point at somebody who is, let us say, um, Saldamini's color and ask the children, what, what color is she? You can bet your bottom dollar that the children will come to the conclusion that Saldamini is white. And they would probably say the same thing about me. 
The teacher will then take a piece of white paper and ask the children what color that is. They will look at it and say, ah, that's white. She'll then put that white paper against the portrait that is Sao Domini's color and ask the question again, is Sao Domini or this portrait white? Well, of course it's not white, because if you look at Sao Domini's face or, or my face, you know, white, um, white simply doesn't match me. These are different colors. We'll look at a portrait of a child who looks perhaps like Declan, if I may use you as an example. Um, and we ask the children, so what color is Declan? And you can bet your bottom dollar they will say, black, Declan is black. Okay, asks the teacher, if Declan is black, can anybody tell me what color is Declan's mustache and beard? And the hair we can see of Declan's. Well, of course, that is black. Yes, so if that's black, then Declan's skin is not black. So we are actually starting our children off with very divisive labels. Very soon, those divisive labels are going to mean a great deal as language and culture intertwine. When children start learning idioms and metaphors like the black heart of the villain, the white angel from heaven, the black sheep of the family, a black mark against your name, we could go on. What are we teaching our children? It is not true that I am white and Declan is black. Every single one of us is brown and the teacher proves this to the children with one brown crayon. So they see with their own eyes that we are one family. We're just different shades of brown. So that is the kind of teaching. It's always concrete. It's always positive and truthful and accurate. And a child that learns that at the age of three, honestly, cannot grow up and, uh, you know, have a view about characteristics pertaining to black people or brown people or white people. Um, sorry, that was a long example. Perhaps I shouldn't have chosen my favorite one because I was bound to speak long about it. <laughs> so, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Well, that's food for thought. Um, you know, what? but I think the bottom line is we are diverse, yet we are one human family. I it's think important. that is the message. That, yeah, the uh, message you do. Sheila, yes. can I just say, here is a beautiful example where something that started in, in the so-called, you know, West. Um, <laughs> I hate these, these border divides between us as well. We're, we're a global um, um, family, but actually has taken its philosophy and its foundation um, from Africa. In this case, we have four of you who are from Africa um, and, and it's pure Ubuntu. You are the other me and I am the other you. And if we, if we hold each other to be of equal value, then human rights violations fall away. 